person of Jesus Christ. Thus far, we've looked at the relationship between the divinity and the humanity of Jesus and how people uh, began to try to understand that. We then, uh, in the last lecture, looked at Arius and the uh, and uh, Nicaea and the question of, is the Son created, begotten? What's the relationship there? And uh, today what we want to do is look a little bit more at uh, who Jesus is and how they began to try to understand uh, the divinity of Christ in relation to the humanity of Christ, uh, but then um, get into the Chalcedonian formula, the, the formula that they've kind of say, all right, this is what we mean when we talk about the divinity and the humanity of Christ. Uh, and then we'll talk a little bit about the doctrine of the Trinity here at the end. And it's important to recognize how the doctrine of the Trinity flows out of uh, the understanding that this person, Jesus Christ, is fully God. How can we be monotheists and yet worship Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? So we'll talk about that. So as we think about the person of Jesus Christ um, and the relationship between divinity and humanity, what it boils down to is what is the relationship between the human nature and the divine nature? And what does that mean for Jesus as a person? So one of the questions to think about is, is the person of Jesus Christ two persons, a divine person in nature and a human person in nature in this human being? Um, or is, is it more like um, the human Jesus, the body, uh, and then you have the divinity that is the soul. So really, it's a question about these types of relationships. And now you may say, well, why does any of this matter? Well, it matters because it, eventually, as we look at the Chalcedonian definition, there's a sense in which groups would fall off to either side. And they would either begin overemphasizing the humanity at the expense of the divinity, or they would begin uh, overemphasizing the divinity at the expense of the humanity. And if you remember, we talked about Athanasius, who basically made the claim, if Jesus Christ is not fully God and fully human, then there is no salvation. Uh, and so thinking through these questions became a way of, of um, trying to understand that relationship uh, and trying to kind of protect this idea of the full humanity and full divinity. Of Jesus Christ. So you get a group called Apollinarianism, which emphasizes that Jesus had a human body and a human soul, but then had a divine spirit. Um, the Nestorianism, which uh, emphasized Christ having uh, two natures and almost uh, suggesting that there's there are two distinct persons, two hypostases, so that they really are not mingled together. So you have a human and a div the divine, uh, which raises questions then about, you know, how does, how does that work? Um, and then you have the Monophysites who think of mono. They want to say that Christ is one nature, one hypostasis, kind of one person. Um, so there's humanity and divinity, but there's a oneness that is there. And so how do you then protect the hum human nature and the divine nature, how they related to one another? It just raises all these, these types of, of questions. Well, in response, what we end up with is um, the, Cal the Council of Chalcedon, which came up with what is known as the Chalcedonian definition. And I want to read this definition because I, I think it's an ingenious way of trying to articulate the person of Jesus Christ. And we begin to see theologically how they're trying to maintain certain things and protect certain things. So here's what it says. We then, following the Holy Fathers, all with one consent, teach men to confess one and the same Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, the same perfect in Godhead and also perfect in manhood. So let me stop. Divinity and humanity. Perfect in, in both, but fully both. Truly God, truly man, of a reasonable soul and body, consubstantial with us according to the manhood. All right, now what is this talking about? Well, it's saying that he had a human soul and a human body. And consubstantial is to say that it shares in the same substance with our humanity. So if Jesus' humanity is totally different than ours, that whole Ath Athanasius point still stands. Um, then we're not saved. So God is taking upon God's self full human nature that shares in our human nature. That's what he's saying here. In all things like unto us without sin, begotten before all, all ages of the Father according to the Godhead, and in these latter days for us and for our salvation, born of the Virgin Mary, the mother of God, according to the manhood. So what's born, uh, again, the sense of humanity. Why emphasize Mary? Jesus' humanity. There's a sense in which the emphasis upon Mary um, comes out of an affirmation and a, an insistence that Jesus was fully uh, human. One and the same Christ, Son, Lord, only begotten, to be acknowledged in two natures, inconfusedly, unchangeably, indivisibly, inseparably, the distinction of natures being by no means taken away by the union, but rather the property of each nature being preserved 
and concurring in one person and in one subsistence, not parted or divided into two persons, but one and the same Son, and only begotten God the Word, the Lord Jesus Christ. So here you can, you, uh, you can see them articulating what they're trying to say. There are two natures, and these natures maintain their own properties and, and so on. They're not mingled up. So the monophysite is this emphasis on humanity and divinity, one nature, one person. Uh, and the Chalcedonian definition is saying, no, there's a human nature and a divine nature in one person. So they're not two persons. They're one person with two natures, fully human, fully divine. And it's not as though they're mixed up. It's also not as though they're totally separated from one another. That's the one person piece here. And again, I, I recognize that for many people who aren't used to thinking kind of theologically about these things, the question might be, who cares? We believe in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. Why does it matter? Well, again, it, it, it speaks to the heart of what the Christian faith is about, that God has come to redeem humanity and redeem all of creation. And that in doing so, God has taken upon God's self full humanity. And so again, we're back to Athanasius saying that God, it's God who's doing the acting. And so it's full divinity taking upon God's self full humanity. And that becomes the basis for our salvation. So in some way, it's important to think about how theologically we're talking about the God who comes to save us from sin and the transformation of all creation. And philosophically, what we're beginning to wrestle with is what is the relationship between the eternal and the temporal? What is the relationship between the God who is beyond and the creation that God has, has made? And so we see here how the early Christian church is articulating an understanding of how these, the, the temporal and the eternal have come together in the person of, uh, of Jesus Christ. And that is the significance of the Chalcedonian uh, definition. Now, interestingly, there are still Nestorian Christians and Monophysite Christians. I think the Monophysites are in Egypt. Nestorian Christians still live in, in Syria, or they did. Um, and so there are different Christian traditions that kind of hold on to differences here. But the Chalcedonian definition has become kind of the way of making sense of the person of Jesus Christ and the two natures. So now from there, we want to shift to talking about the doctrine of the Trinity. And these, this doctrine is connected with beliefs about Jesus Christ, so that we've affirmed now the full divinity of Jesus Christ. And at the Council of Constantinople, there's a full affirmation of the divinity, full divinity of the Holy Spirit. So then it's, it, it's a matter of now trying to say, how are we still monotheists? How are we worshiping Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and yet we're monotheistic, worshiping one God? And again, the doctrine of the Trinity is flowing out of the testimony of Scripture. The, the testimony about the divinity of Jesus as being fully God and the divinity of the, the Holy Spirit as well. And then how do we make sense of this? So what I want to do is break it up into the West and the East. On the Western side, you get uh, a guy named Tertullian, who is very much into Roman law. Um, and, and we kind of see this. And, and I don't want to overstate this, but what you get in the West with Tertullian is a real emphasis upon the oneness. Um, of course, you're going to see there's an emphasis upon the plurality of, of Father, Son, Holy Spirit, the different persons of the Trinity, but a real emphasis on, on oneness. Now, how does he do this? He actually uses kind of legal language. It's important to recognize how the West tends to be much more legal. And when I say legal, think of law. In other words, we got to explain everything. We got to get everything out. What do we mean by this? What do we mean by this? And in the East, they're much more philosophical. So if you think about the Greeks and so on, um, and in Orthodoxy, it's, it's interesting, the Eastern Orthodox Church, there's less concern with trying to explain everything, and you see that more, uh, more in the West, and that becomes one of the bits that separates the East, uh, the East from the West. So Tertullian uses legal language, and what do we mean by that is he wants to talk about a monarchy or a kingdom. And so the substance, if we think of, of the, the language of the Trinity, three persons, one nature, or three persons, one substance. Um, what he's actually talking about is property rights. Who has the right to a property and who has the right to use it? And a person is a legal person who has a right to a substance. And so the godness here of the kingdom is one substance. And so he'll talk about a kingdom where you have a king and a queen, sons and daughters, princes, princesses, uh, and, and even other aspects of it. And what he says is there's one kingdom. Um, and that one kingdom is expressed in all of these different persons and the roles that they play within that, that kingdom. And so he wants us to think about the term divine, divine economy, um, the, the relationship, the roles that people are playing 
uh, where God, Godness, is the substance. So the Father and the Son and the Spirit share in the same substance, the nature. But there are three persons, and they have their different ways of of acting um, and and uh, uh, within the divine economy. And so that's a, a kind of Tertullian way of thinking about uh, the doctrine of the Trinity. Now, when you go to the East, what you find are the Cappadocians. You find Basil the, uh, Basil the Great, Gregory of Nyssa, and Gregory of, of Nazius, uh, along with uh, Gregory and Basil's sister, Macarena of, of Nyssa. Uh, and where what you get in the East is really much more of an emphasis upon um, the three persons. And so you'll see here, I have up uh, the icon of the Trinity, which is a picture of the visitors who come to Abraham. And you can see in the Eastern icon of the Trinity, there's an emphasis upon the three persons. So the difference, now they still are going to emphasize the oneness. Um, so the, the usia and the hypostasis, right? So if we think of the being or, or the nature is the, the general, uh, whereas the hypostasis becomes the particular. Now you could make these arguments, and I want to be careful with this, but um, so when you think about human beings, we have particular human beings who all share in the nature of humanness, or you could do the same thing with other creatures. Um, that's the essence or the substance, the, the godness, uh, but a, that godness manifests itself in three hypostasis, so Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And in the East, what you get is a real emphasis upon relationship. So what are the relations? The Son is begotten of the Father, and the Spirit is is proceeds or generated and so again it's, it's never about conflating that there's a sense of difference father son holy spirit all god fully god but yet um, marked out in their particularity in their relations in, in the relations in that relationality so the, the father begets the son and the spirit proceeds from the father now if you remember back to the nicene creed we talked about how it says the spirit proceeds from the father and the son the and the son was a clause that was added later. The Eastern Church holds to the fact that um, the son is begotten and the spirit proceeds from the father, but the spirit does not proceed from the son. And a part of that is the distinction of uh, persons. And if we say that the, the spirit proceeds from the father and the son, now we end up with two in the position of father, the, the father and the son and the, the spirit who is subordinated. Whereas the distinction of of relations in begetting and proceeding maintains that threeness and that kind of emphasis on um, emphasis on the Trinity. And again, I know that for some of you, this might sound like abstract, just um, unnecessary um, discussion. But what I would want you to begin thinking about, and this is why I, I actually believe the doctrine of the Trinity is, is very important, and it grounds us uh, as Christians in, in who we are. Um, uh, that when we think about that community, that relationality, that when 1 John 4, it says God is love, that is a Trinitarian verse. Because from the Eastern perspective, what you're getting is that relationality is at the center of who God is. And that it leads to all of these different ways of thinking about creation, for example. Why would God create? Um, God didn't have to create, but in some sense, creation becomes this overflow of the very nature of who God is. That God is relationality and brings forth in love a creation to be caught up into the divine community. This is the importance of the doctrine of the Trinity. Um, I think it speaks to our, what it means to be made in the image of God. Increasingly, we come to see our human identity as being relational. relational. Um, neuroscience is increasingly recognizing relationality in, in the, as an important building block to identity. Um, so again, all of these things, I think, are reflected in this understanding of the doctrine of the Trinity. So it is, it is more than just some archaic abstract philosophical doctrine it is a reflection of scripture the god who is in relationship with adam and eve with the people of israel you find in genesis 1 god speaks the word and the breath of the spirit moves across the water that is trinitarian spirit breath wind all the same word john 1 in the beginning was the word the word was god and the word was with god um, so we see that the doctrine of the Trinity is a way in which uh, Christians are making sense of that biblical testimony. Now, maybe there's a way for us to do it using different categories um, and not Greek. Uh, but I think what the Greek categories do for us is provide a foundation for us to begin to speak about the reality and the experienced reality of God as community and the relationality of God that is expressed 
on the cross and in the resurrection, the love of God for the world that both creates and saves. So, so that's the doctrine of the Trinity. We could talk about a lot of other things. We talk about Augustine's view of the Trinity, where he talks about memory, um, uh, uh, speech, and knowledge. Um, uh, and you see that in his uh, confessions, where he kind of talks about the, that Trinitarian uh, perspective. There are other ways of, of, kind of talking about it that develop theologically. Um, but again, what I want you to see is how it moves from an understanding of the person of Jesus Christ and the full divinity of the person of Jesus Christ. So from the Chalcedonian definition, moving then into the doctrine of the Trinity. And these become the categories that we now have and use to express our understanding of scripture uh, as we think about uh, who God is. So in the next lecture, we will talk a little bit more about Augustine and we'll talk about Pelagius and um, we'll talk about human nature and sin and the fall and try to make some sense of how people like Augustine and others um, wanted to talk about uh, the problem of sin um, and what it means to be a human being.